Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Welcome to the first episode of Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where we go deep into the world of Charles Schultz and the Peanuts gang. I'm Jimmy Gownley. Uh, if you know me from anything, you might know me from my comic books, Amelia Rules, The Dumbest Idea Ever, or Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. And joining me, as always, are my two co-hosts. Uh, first, we have the composer behind the band Complicated People, as well as this very podcast, and the cartoonist behind such strips as Tangled River, A Gathering of Spells and Strange Attractors, Mr. Michael Cohen. Hello there. And we also have with us former vice president of Archie Comics, executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, and creator of the Instagram strip Sweetest Beasts, Harold Buckholtz. Hello. And Harold, how how do you feel? Do you feel feel nervous? Do you feel excited? What are you you looking forward to? I feel excited. Peanuts is something that... Uh, is, yeah, it's just been such a big part of my life, and and uh, to be able to unpack it and take a look at it and, and understand a little bit of, of what that impact was is, I think, it's gonna be super helpful to me, and I think I'm not alone. So just just to give us some background, Michael, why don't you tell us uh, where and who you were when you first discovered this comic strip? Okay, well, I was very young. I'm the elder spokesman of the group, by the way, as you'll figure out, because Peanuts debuted almost exactly a month after I was born. Wow. Um, And I remember quite distinctly going over to my aunt and uncle's house and playing on the floor with these little plastic toys. And I think I was around five or six, so we'd be talking 1955, 1956, And I remember being on the floor and looking over at their bookcase, seeing this little green volume. And I went over there and it was, so it was just called the good old Charlie Brown. That's right. Um, Which I think was maybe the fourth volume from the series. Uh, And I was just like totally captivated. They also had Snoopy, which might've been the third or fourth and peanuts and more peanuts. And I remember, I think I just asked if I could have them. <laughs> so, or I stole them. I don't know. But I ended up with those copies and read them like thousands of times. And up through the late 60s, I bought every volume as they came out. Wow. Um, so I had quite a big collection of those. But uh, to me, it was just so amazing because I don't even think I was following any newspaper cartoons at the time. Uh, it was just a whole new world, and I still learned a lot about the world from reading these things. I mean, there was words I didn't know, and there was, you know, Schultz was dealing with some, you know, pretty heavy subject matter. So to me, it was like the best school I ever had. All right, all right. Harold, how about you? Well, from a very young age, I was fascinated by the printed word and cartoons, um, when I was a toddler, my mom caught me uh, on the floor of the house with an upside-down Time magazine picking at the letters. Um, I, I was just fascinated with prints. And when I was three, I remember um, I was reading the Sunday comics section. It was Nancy and um, trying to make sense of the strip. And it didn't make sense. And, it, and I knew enough that it didn't make sense that I was close enough to making sense of it. But I went to my father and I said, "What's? why did this happen? And he's like, oh, you're, you're reading it exactly backwards i was like in the lower right corner reading tales. this is before anybody adult had even thought to tell me here's how you read in order this is so pre-reading wow but i was trying to make sense through comics of, of a story with the mixture of the picture and the words and and i discovered that i was reading it backwards and it was something that for some reason is a memory that i have it's so strong of you know how comics you know tied it into my life and I was drawing my own comics from the age of three. I was a little bird named Birdie, of course, <laughs> uh, with a sideways V for a beak. And I had a little turtle who kind of looked like, like the head of a Pac-Man, pre-Pac-Man, <laughs> and two sticks coming out of the, the, the bottom of the, this little head for legs. And looking at those comics um, from my from my earliest years, I still have some. Uh, I was struck by the, the power of emotion in them. 
as a little kid, you know, I, I was wasn't very articulate, but I, I felt things very deeply. And I think as adults, we sometimes forget, um, you know, how much is actually going on inside as you're trying to live your life as a little kid. And, and this is where peanuts comes in, because I think by around the age of seven, I began to receive these little faucet crest peanuts mass market paperbacks, mm-hmm. like little 50 cent uh, books. And I was reading large chunks of the strip for the first time. And I think that's when it had the first major impact on me. Uh, I think Schultz's world opened up to me and, and the depth of feeling in those strips communicated to my soul in ways that, that no human interaction yet had. So again, it's like comics are kind of pre mm-hmm. <laughs> pre experience of anything else. Uh, you know, and, and Peanuts was was speaking to me in a way that I, I had not yet processed as as a kid growing up. And so, without an irony, I can say that somehow um, Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Lucy and Linus were more real to me than anybody I knew. Mm-hmm. And that's a strange thing to say, but I, I think that's true, especially Linus. I connected to and related to Linus like nobody else in my life at that time. And somehow Charles Schultz through Peanuts was let me know um, somebody and be known. Mm-hmm. And that is a very strange thing to say about a little black and white comic strip, line art comic strip. But looking back on it 45 years later, I marvel at the impact that that strip had on my life. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. For, for me, I remember yeah, it predates almost everything. It really predates almost everything. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons but when some, when you find this particular strip really, really young, is that why you're drawn to make them yourself? Because it, it imprints on you so young? For me, I, I, what happened was uh, my cousins from Philadelphia would come up to visit our mutual grandmother um, every Memorial Day. Uh, and then every Labor Day, they were big into any holiday they could go to a cemetery and, and mourn someone. So they would come to visit. <laughs> and they, but they brought these Peanuts books. And the one that struck me was this thing called What's It All About, Charlie Brown? And I don't know if you guys know this one, yeah. but the cover of it is Snoopy's doghouse burning okay. and saying, you know, my books, my pool table, my records, my Van Gogh. And uh, it was half the comic strip and half some sort of bizarre, you know, self-help pop psychology book and I couldn't read any of that stuff I mean I was three years old or whatever but the strips within them I absolutely loved and I remember to this day one in particular I I remember coloring it in the in the book I still have the book I'll post it in the show notes my my actual copy I had uh, which it's I believe it's Schroeder or it's Charlie Brown and Linus, or Charlie Brown and Schroeder, actually, I think it is, because it's in the middle of winter, and you can't see who they are because they're wearing hats, and it's snowing. And they're like, oh, we should go. There's Snoopy. He looks so cold. We should go and comfort him. And they walk over, and they say, be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer. And they just walk away, and Snoopy has a question mark over his head. And I read that. I'm like, I don't get this at all. But I think when I understand that, I will understand something important about life. (laughs) And the thing I loved about it was that it always felt as familiar as the kids I played with in my town and always also a little bit beyond me, a little bit out of reach. And I I love that. Uh, But the other thing I have to say is I also can't remember a time when Charlie Brown Christmas wasn't in my consciousness because my other earliest memories would be watching a Charlie Brown Christmas and going out with my dad to cut down our very own Charlie Brown Christmas tree. We'd find the rattiest, weediest looking tree and bring it home. <laughs> and I'd decorate it with hand-drawn peanuts ornaments in a Charlie Brown and Snoopy. That was the only tree you had? <laughs> no, we had a real tree too. No, mom wasn't going to go for that. Come on, you know? Um, but yeah, so those are, are my absolute uh, earliest memories. And so I'm really excited about the fact that we are going to get to go on the journey together. We're going to get to talk about it um, because we all love it. And I hope, and obviously if you're out there listening, you guys love it too, right? So we're taking you back to October 1950. Everybody remembers October 1950, of course. Uh, first class postage was just three cents. So tell Harold, what do you, what do you think? What would it be like for someone like Charles Schultz, who's at this point, he's just about to turn 28. So how old was he? He's 28 years old and we're just there. about to. He's living in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is not a place that is no, all the, all the syndicates. Uh, all the people that put the comic strips out into the newspapers of the world are in much larger cities, Chicago, New York. Right. Yeah. 
So, so what, so tell us, what, do you, what would it be like for a guy like that to, to get this? So to paint a, paint a picture of Charles Schultz, so here's this mild mannered kid who's, who's grown up in, in St. Paul his whole life. Um, he, he's, uh, taken a correspondence school in art specifically, apparently, because it had a good section on Correct, cartoon. Right. And he wanted to be a cartoonist. There's something he knew he wanted to do. And, and here he is in, in St. Paul. And interestingly, um, in the Twin Cities, that is where the art instruction schools are. So it's kind of funny that he's taking this and sending this stuff in, even though the actual course with the instructors is in. Right. In and, and I'm certain that, 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 that an element of that was his personal shyness. He, he talked through his life about how shy he felt and how he felt invisible in crowds and stuff like that. I think a, car, a cartooning correspondence course is, is a perfect Charles Schultz solution. And that, you know, is, is a relatively new thing. You know, if you were an artist, you usually had to go to a major city mm-hmm. and traverse that city and, and be able to figure that city out and be willing to to go into that kind of environment to be an artist. And this is a, a unique thing where here's somebody, a shot guy, and he's he's just doing it all out of out of his, his apartment above his dad's barbershop. I think right. That's, right. Um, that's that's a different artist than the type of commercial artist that was, you know, was, was usually getting work prior to that. They were probably a little more extroverted on, on, on average. They had to be in order to, to, yeah. to do what, needed to, to, what it took to become it. Well, yeah. And interestingly, um, you know, uh, the National Cartoonist Society is, is an organization of professional cartoonists and it was known as one of the hard, drinkingest, wildest bunches yeah. that you can imagine. And this was at a time when a newspaper syndicated cartoonist was a celebrity position. And, and they, they would make money hand over fist, guys like Al Cap and Ham Fisher and all those those guys. Yeah. So this is this is a whole different world. From- he's, he's aspiring to something in, in this in his, his, his field that has has really big upside. I mean this is a this is a dream, but he's he's committed to this dream and then World War II comes along. He's finished the correspondence course, but he's he's now uh, in in Europe during World War II as this very young kid. I think his mother passes away right around the time of going to, off to war. Yeah, and well, she says to him as he's leaving, "Well, Sparky, everyone called him Sparky." And one of the great ironies of his life, or or synchronicities of his life, I guess you could say, he was nicknamed after a comic strip character, a horse in the in the comic strip Barney Google. So she said to him, "Well, Sparky, I guess it's the last time we'll see each other." And then he went off to war. That's brutal. Yes, it is brutal. And and talk about loneliness. I mean, he's obviously. You know, there's this mixture of loneliness and being surrounded by people that he has in World War II. He continues to draw. Um, he's, he's not forgetting his goal. He comes back after World War II and he actually gets a job with the same place. Which is Art Instruction School is the name of the correspondence course. And I would just say, just tangentially, I don't know if either of you guys have ever seen, uh, one of the courses, but my neighbor, I lived in this little tiny town, Gerardville, Pennsylvania, a, a, a very creative town. I lived on A Street. Literally, they could not even bother to name it. It's just called a street. A street right? uh, but like three doors down, um, the neighbor's daughter took the famous artist course, and I got to see all the binders of the. It's legit. It yeah. was really an impressive course. If you, it was all on you. You had to do it. Right. But boy, if you did it, I think you would have gotten a legitimate art education. He obviously took that extremely seriously, and that he must have been a good student and a very fastidious student. For him to come back to them and say, you know, I just graduated from your course mm-hmm. a few years ago, and I, I, he's going to try to take on a job basically doing the instructor side of what he had taken not too long ago without really a whole lot of experience under his belt, mm-hmm. other than he was a very good student. That's probably all they had to go on. So right. that kind of speaks to who, who he was. And so he's working locally trying to find his way into cartooning, which is not easy in St. Paul, Minnesota. But to his credit, I think it kind of speaks to who he was as a person. He's very committed. I think there was a Catholic kids comic, and I think it was based out of St. Paul comic mm-hmm. topics. And he was he was lettering pages at the rate not per page, but a dollar fifty an hour. Mm-hmm. So he was working, I'm guessing, pretty fast and not getting a whole lot of money. But at least he was working in comics, and he, he sold I think a couple of ten dollar pages of single panel jokes to them as well. Some of them featuring little children, so it's kind of the first time he's getting published um, with the kind of comics that we know him for. 
And one of the cartoons on this page it shows this girl running a potato sack race, but um, instead of her jumping, and she's got the sack upside down over her head, and her legs are sticking out below, running at full speed, and it looks like their parents are just standing by trees. And the, the mom says to the husband, are you sure Judy understood the rules of the sack race? <laughs> it's genuinely funny. It's, it's absurd, right. but, you know, it's, it's got those elements of, of peanuts um, that that we, we see later. Right. Um, that, well, you know, and one of the other things that's really uh, it, it's happening at the same time or roughly at the same time is he, he starts doing uh, newspaper strips for his own uh, his own local paper, the St. Paul Pioneer Press Gazette, Post Gazette. It's like, yeah, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Yeah. And now, Michael, have you seen the, the little folk stuff? Have you ever read those? I don't know if they've been republished. I do have an issue with the Comics Journal with the huge Schultz right. interview, and they, they print some of them. Uh, they're actually funny. They are pretty funny. They're they not peanuts. They're one panel. No, but would yeah. you recognize it as Schultz art? Oh, absolutely. Right. Right. I, I think so, too. I think it, it's interesting because he's doing this um, as a, it's essentially a gag strip, but multiple, multiple panels. He, he, I think he did two or three different little vignettes in each strip. And this is weekly. Weekly. He's one picture. Was in the women's section, I think. Yes, paper. exactly. Right. And he uh, um and at the same time, though, he's submitting these gag strips to major market magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. And so he has quite a success with that. That's his first national success is that Saturday Evening Post picks up these single panel cartoons that it's little kids in big, big people's settings. You know, they're wearing oversized skis to a comic effect or a little girl. I think the famous one is a little girl standing in high heels and she's angled mm -hmm. at the angle of where her feet are in these giant shoes. Right, and his first one that he sold was actually the the gag is it's a tiny little kid sitting on a giant lounge chair, but with his feet hanging off, resting on an ottoman in front of it that he obviously didn't need. So, so as personal of a strip that Peanuts actually eventually became, it's interesting that really I think one of the reasons it's about kids is because that's the thing that was selling. Yeah, and, and, and consistently. I mean, we don't see anything else he's doing that doesn't have the kid element mm -hmm. in it. And he sold like 17 of these single panel yeah. cartoons. And the competition to get into the Saturday Evening Post by cartoonists was fierce. It was probably one of the top five paying um, spaces you could sell into and probably the, the best paying spaces you could sell into. He sold 17 of these things over a course of three years. So and I think that was kind of like thing at the time where – there were certain strips that would start out in a magazine and or panels and they became so much a, a good seller that the same like Hazel, I think the, the maid right. was in, was in the magazine cartoons and then ultimately got pulled out and became its own thing because they kept buying these funny cartoons right. from this, from the same artist over and over again. People got to know these characters, characters right? Right. Lulu, I think it was like that. Well. Lulu, Lulu, Henry, yeah, all those, there, there are a couple like that. And that, that's fascinating that, that he was that successful. That is so hard to get in, even one joke in there. And he got 17 of right. them. But what he's not doing is creating characters, which I think is really interesting. That's, yeah. That's it's, right. So basically what happens to, to kind of cut to the chase and get to the, to the, the peanuts of the matter is he asks for a raise from the Pioneer Post <laughs> Gazette and they tell him to go take a hike. So he loses his spot in that paper, in his hometown paper. And now if he wants to be a cartoonist, he's going to have to sell it. Uh, yeah, and, and for some, some, for some perspective, what he was paid in today's dollars over the three, three year period post war, when he really started getting in, into trying to get published from 1947 to 1950 when Peanuts debuts, he made about $25,000 in today's dollars. Being a guy who had no background mm -hmm. out of St. Paul, um, Minnesota, that's not bad for an well, aspiring cartoonist. Yeah, what would it, what's, was the average salary? Like four or five thousand dollars a year, probably? Well, yeah, I'm talking about today's dollars, just to kind of, I can, if you just, oh, I see, just a correlation, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, for a, a freelancer who's super young, mm -hmm. he's, he's determined, he's really working hard to, to get something going. And I believe what he said was, all during this time, he's also, you know, not only he's got this job, he's, he's doing art instruction schools, he's getting all these cartoons into the local the local paper, regular feature. He also has the the stuff in Saturday Post, but he's he's also sending things out to syndicates, right, to try to get national. So right to get nationally syndicated. So he decides he's going to take a trip on a train to New York City. He goes to United Feature Syndicate and he has two packs. One pack contains basically little folks gag strips. Another pack contains daily comic strips. Okay, which don't really have 
and still defined characters. He arrives too early at the offices of the syndicate, United Features, so he goes out for breakfast. By the time he comes back, the editors that be have opened the packs and said, hey, if you can do a comic strip and create some definite characters, we would like the strip. And just like that, boom, Charles Schultz is a syndicated cartoonist. So, but I want to talk for a minute about the things that were beyond Schultz's control. First thing that was imposed upon him that I can think of that he had no control over was the name. Right. The syndicate named it Peanuts. That seems to be the case. Uh, and a lot of people can't even figure out why it was given that name. I, I, mean, I have heard it had to do with the peanut gallery from Howdy Doody. Possibly. But the, I, I met somebody recently who, to this day, had no idea that peanuts was actually kind of a little term, a, cur- a term for little kids. It would be right. like a, a, a pet name. Hey, peanut. Right. Um, you know, they they didn't associate it with kids in any way. So it was a great mystery. Right. You know, it never occurred to me that it was associated with kids. It just se- sort of seemed like it was like a Kleenex. I don't know why it's called that. It just is what it is. Uh, but he hated it to to his dying day. He hated the name Peanuts. Other things, uh, the fact Peanuts every single day was four panels. They were the exact same size, never varied. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why that that was a thing. So apparently, one of the things that the editor was looking at when he was when he saw the the strip and he saw this new version that was in strip form was he was looking for a, an angle, I guess, to sell a new strip to these newspapers is super competitive to get your strip in the newspaper and editors are hard to, to get to switch out one strip for another. And this was at a time when post-war newsprint prices were through the roof because they put caps on newsprint all through world war two as a commodity during the war. And then as soon as they took the prices off of it, it it skyrocketed. It went up like up like 70% from 1945 to 1948. It was starting to go up again in 1950 and the news, the newspaper people were going nuts over this because it, all of their profits were being eaten away. So this editor decides, hey, let's let's try to sell a strip that is somehow more efficient, uses less newsprint than than anything else. Because I mean, if you can imagine, it's pretty the same thing a hundred thousand times every day. If it's smaller and you can still have the entertainment value, supposedly that's a sales point to a cartoon editor. And so that is. It's it's kind of strange. This utilitarian approach to this strip is kind of an indignity for for Schultz. That that's the main thing they're selling. It's not Schultz's brilliant work. It's the fact that this thing is tiny and can be reconfigured any which way. Yeah, it can be printed vertically. It can be printed horizontally. It can be printed as a square. So that was it. You know, you didn't have uh, InDesign and Photoshop. So that was a, a big benefit uh, to the editor, theoretically. But it only ended up in a handful of papers. I've always heard seven. But uh, the Wikipedia uh, article says nine and then later says seven. So we're going to have to double check You've on seen that. seven. Apparently, they've added in uh, New York and Boston, which others accounts say was not initially there when it first debuted. So, but, but basically, less than 10 papers. Which is very low for a launch of a paper. Now, to his credit, he got into the number two market, Chicago, number four market, Washington Post. So he was probably in the metro area, like tw- reaching 12 and, up to 12 and a half million people. So I was like, you know, that's 8% of the U.S. population to start out. Not terrible. No, but it's, well, it's crazy when you think about what shows like that are considered culturally, you know, huge Game of Thrones or whatever today get compared to his audience at its peak was something like 300 million people. Right. And 12.5 million is, is, is the, all the people that could, could be. Right, right, right. <laughs> so how many actually did? But still, those are, you know, some big cities and some major circulation. So even though not a lot of strips and not a lot of cities, but he wasn't in tiny, tiny markets. So he was making... Yeah decent money to start even though he had such a low a low paper count right so 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 that brings us up to october 1950 one of the things you might not know out there if you're just coming to peanuts now or if that or if you're a millennial or something something ridiculous like that um but these really early peanuts uh comic strips had never been reprinted in in their totality until uh, Fanagraph started releasing the complete Peanuts volume. So, Michael, can you talk to me a little bit about what it was like the first time you saw these very, very early strips and what it was like when you were reading them from this podcast? Okay. Um, they 
reprinted Peanuts and more Peanuts. That probably the first two volumes of the was it Valentine of the mm-hmm. books, um, which I always considered clearly less brilliant material. It was mm-hmm. like I always thought, well, okay, it took him a year or two to get the engine running and and figure out who these characters were and, and establish, you know, his, his his sense of humor. So Peanuts and more Peanuts were, you know like early Beatles or something, even though like, you know, occasional flashes right. of brilliance, but still needed a little work. Uh, so are you, are you reading those? Are those like 1952 or so? Those first. Well, books? I read the, when I discovered peanuts in 55, 56, I, I had, I got all of these and I, I wasn't too clear on the order, but it was pretty clear that peanuts was the first one and more peanuts was the second one. Right. Um, <laughs> and then reprint strips from 52. Yeah, but they didn't okay. tell you yeah. any of that. So, so you just, I like... just had to guess it. But anyway, right. I always f- figured these were, you know, these were okay. You know, a few laughs here and there. But definitely, I would not st- ask someone to start with the first ones. Um, and then when uh, the Panagraphics books came out, of course, they, they, they're doing it chronologically. So the first volume came out. I had to get it and discovered that those books that I – read thousands of times those early peanuts books were not complete i didn't realize that right and so I, there was i'd seen maybe 30 40 percent of them um so yeah i'm reading the fanographics books i was just fascinated with these because first of all they were funnier than i remember and actually he did have you know quite a sharp sense of humor from the beginning and what, what was just so interesting to me was that he didn't have the final versions in his head. I mean, the versions we know, you know, had to develop slowly. Right. So it's just like you think, okay, this is Charlie Brown, but you realize this, is this Charlie Brown? I mean, he's got the same name. He looks the same, but he's not quite the same personality. Right. Um, A lot of that comes out of the fact that it was, he was originally a gag cartoonist and, and creating character was way, way down, you know, on his list. But all right, I don't want to get too in the weeds. I just want, but I just want general first impressions. Harold, how about you? When you, when you tell me about the first time you saw these particular strips. Well, as a as a little kid, um, they reprinted I think just a few of the 1950 strips, particularly the, the first strip. Mm-hmm. And I, I was disappointed as a kid because I oh, there's stuff that goes all this way back, but, and then I'm like, oh, that's not the peanuts I know. And uh, you know, I think my view of it was like, this is. It's crisp. It's very crisp. It's kind of bland mm-hmm. um, compared to what I was used to with peanuts. Um, but again, looking at it as a little bit older, I, I, there's there's something that's so unique in the personality of it. There's this. It's kind of stoic, and there's this honor and humility and smallness that Schultz puts in there that I really don't see anywhere else. And to to find that in the early strips is is in this really beginning stages of Schultz's. Um, run with peanuts is, is, is pretty fascinating. Yeah, to me, looking at them, I think the, the one thing I would just say is they look the most 50s to me. Yeah. You know, I could sort of see this coming out of the UPA studio. This it doesn't, it looks like a cleaner Jules Pfeiffer, maybe so like a New Yorker kind of feel. So it doesn't feel Schultz as much as it feels just generally 50s. So I think that's a good place to leave it for part one. Please join us next time where we take an in-depth look at the very first Peanut Strips. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening, you blockhead!